Hi, this is Karin Zesses of ASCOA Online. The United States and Mexico have a lot more in common than sharing a border. Over 10% of the U.S. population is Mexican or Mexican-American, and there are more U.S. citizens living abroad in Mexico than in any other country. For decades, the two economies have been closely intertwined, particularly given free trade agreements. Of course, every relationship has its problems, and this one is no different. But when it comes to challenges in U.S.-Mexico ties, usually people think of things like organized crime or immigration. What's probably less likely to spring to mind? Corn. Precisely an issue that's been a recent stumbling block between these two countries. Las tortillas, el maíz, el lío en el que podría meterse México con Estados Unidos y Canadá por el maíz genéticamente modificado. The U.S. corn farmers are urging Congress to stop what they say could be a looming catastrophe. It all stems from a new proposal in Mexico banning U.S. imports of genetically modified corn. Mexico Now the problem started in 2020 when Mexico said it would phase out imports of genetically modified corn. That's no small matter for the United States, which is the world's biggest corn producer and exporter, given that 90% of the corn it grows is in fact GM corn, and Mexico is its second biggest export market. We're talking about $5 billion dollars worth of corn a year. Time, the administrations refused to trigger the USMCA to contest Mexico's planned exclusion of American corn. Madam Secretary, our farmers feel like that this administration is putting Mexican assembly workers ahead of farmers. What are we waiting for? Grassley what earlier we waiting for? that there is no negotiating on Mexico's ban on biotech corn because the science is clear on that. The U.S. wasn't happy with this plan and said it violated the USMCA trade deal. And in February, Mexico pulled back and removed a 2024 deadline to phase out the use of GM corn for animal feed, which is most of what it imports from the U.S. Still, it left the deadline in place for corn for human consumption, about 20% of what it imports from the United States. It also left the door open to bans for GM feed corn further down the road. In todo caso, se pone por delante la salud. Entonces este asunto todavía no está concluido y nosotros no vamos a Estados Unidos a decirle qué van a consumir. No vamos a decirle, oiga, ya no consuman hamburguesas, son mejores las tortas. Mexican President Andrés Manuel López Obrador has raised questions about whether GM corn could be negative for consumers' health even as the United States counters that there's no scientific basis for that claim. With the two sides at a standstill, the U.S. and Canada requested formal trade consultations on the matter early in March. Now they've got a month to reach a resolution, and if they don't and the dispute continues, Mexico could find itself facing retaliatory tariffs. But if corn is a huge issue for the world's biggest producer, it's also a rallying cry in Mexico, where it was first domesticated 8,700 years ago. Corn is such a staple in Mexico, it, it really touches on the Mexican soul. That's Diego Marroquin, a trade expert who served as a nearshoring fellow for the U.S.-Mexico Foundation and writes regularly on the topic for The Hill and El Universal. We get into just how huge the economic impact would be if Mexico goes ahead with the ban, as well as how USMCA dispute resolution comes into play. You're listening to Latin America in Focus. Latino America in Foco. America Latina in Foco. A podcast by America Society, Council of the Americas on politics, economics, and culture in the region. 
you so much, Diego, for being with me today. For listeners who don't follow Diego's work, he is a master of sharing great data on U.S.-Mexico trade relations. And one area that he follows in particular is corn. So Diego, I want to ask you, how did you develop this passion for trade and in particular, this issue of corn? Thank you. Well, I would like to think that I'm a first generation North American. You know, the North American idea and conversation has like started long before I was even born. But I was, uh, I think I was the first generation in Mexico that experienced free trade. We suddenly had like access to like so many different foods and candy from the U.S. I remember just buying Pop-Tarts. That was like for me, like one of the the benefits of North American integration. And in the case of corn, I, I come from a rural state in Hidalgo. Corn production uh, used to be important there. And I don't know, corn is such a staple in Mexico. It, it really touches on the Mexican soul. And, and it's a very Mexican issue, but it's also a very U.S. Mexico issue. And that's why I decided to do more research about that. Great. So why is corn so important to U.S.-Mexico relations? You know, Mexico is self-sufficient in white corn. That's the corn that uh, we use for tortillas, for example. But Mexico relies on imports of yellow corn, that is genetically modified corn, GMO corn. And no other country in the world imports more yellow corn than Mexico. And no other country in the world produces more yellow corn than the U.S., uh, Mexico imports over 17 million tons of corn. That's roughly $3 billion every year. 93% of those imports come from the U.S. That is almost nine out of every 10 yellow, yellow corn cobs come from states like Kansas, Nebraska, Illinois, and Missouri. And those states export corn in ranges that are like between 60 to 90% of the exports of that specific good. Those exports, according to data from the Brookings Institution, they support over 50,000 jobs. I, I just like to say that corn is not only used for tortillas. We, we use corn to make beer. We use corn for cosmetics. It is used in a myriad of industries. It is also used for livestock feed. That is, without those corn imports, Mexico wouldn't be able to produce milk, chicken, eggs. So that's why that good is so important for the country's food security. Uh, we have a saying in Mexico that says that sin maíz no hay país, there's no country without corn. And just like these figures really show how deeply integrated and interdependent the U.S. and Mexico are when it comes to corn. Now we know why this is such an important issue to these two countries. Let's talk a little bit more about the current dispute. Happening right now, U.S. ag trade officials are in Mexico in hopes of solving recent issues regarding genetically engineered corn. The concern Mexico's pending ban on GMO corn by... How did this discord over corn come about between Mexico and the United States? Okay, so let's go back to 2020. President López Obrador signed a presidential decree banning G uh, imports of GMO corn in 2024. There was a lot of back and forth between the U.S. and the Mexican government that ultimately led to a compromise where Mexico was willing to postpone this ban that's basically uh, until the end of this current administration. That was still not enough, according to the U.S. government. And then there was another decree last just last month it did not solve the issue, and that's why we're in now in technical consultations. This new decree, it is not banning imports of GMO corn for industrial uses, that's agribusiness, cosmetics, beer, but it is banning corn for human consumption. And that's still an issue, that's still a trade barrier, and that's why we're now in, in technical consultations. So the conflict is just because there's, a, there's this delay, is that right? The conflict is because we don't have an all-encompassing solution. What the U.S. wants, or, or what Mexico committed to with USMCA, is not to have any trade restrictions. Mexico has offered to give some permits that stopped giving in 2018 and 2020, 
like there, there's not only corn, there, there was canola, there was cotton. They are starting to give permits for those imports, but I think they're doing it on a case by case basis instead of just like really opening up the agricultural sector. The real issue here is about regulatory predictability. It is very difficult for a farmer in the U.S. to know whether there's going to be a presidential decree coming soon that's going to impact their entire industry. If they don't reach an all-encompassing solution, it's going to be really difficult for farmers to plan out their business and for also the Mexican industry to just see how much they can produce in other basic goods such as milk, eggs, meat, etc. So what's going to happen next? What are, what are the next steps in this dispute? The U.S. requested technical consultations on March 6th. Canada joined on March 8th, just a couple days after. Canada does not export a lot of corn to Mexico, but they are a major exporter of canola, which is also a potential, there could also be a potential dispute there. Uh, Right now we're in the information sharing stage. So they were talking before this, but we weren't like officially talking. We have a, a, like a really clear timeline now. We have 30 days after, it's like starting March 6th, to like share information, share evidence. Mexico needs to demonstrate with data and evidence how those GMO imports have a negative impact on health in the same way that the U.S. needs to show how the presidential decree of February negatively impacts trade for the U.S. So after that, after those 30 days, think of the first week of April. That's when the U.S. can officially request a formal dispute, a process that would take us up to like late September of 2023. And that's where it gets interesting because we have a primary elections in Iowa on February 5th. Mm. Again, a state that imports most of its corn to Mexico. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So from the U.S. side, you know, there's something that's interesting because both countries have elections coming up. We have on the U.S. side the start of the process for the 2024 election. And as you mentioned, a state such as Iowa being affected in, in the middle of this and concerns that you know something has to be done to support our local industry. At the same time, Mexico is going to be starting on its electoral process. And some of these delays that, that AMLO is suggesting will push this problem into the next administration, into whoever might succeed uh, in the presidency. One question I have for you is, why is AMLO taking this position on corn? Is there a reason the AMLO administration is making this decision on corn in particular? Yeah, just a clarifying note, the latest decree does not has like it does not have a like a set date, specific date for the ban or the phase out of GMO corn. So the the bottom line is that there's a clear disconnect between AMLO's nationalistic rhetoric and the facts on the ground. The reality is that U.S. farmers need the Mexican market as much as Mexico needs those imports to put food on the table. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the cost would be huge, and we can talk about that. This issue, if you look at it from the Mexican perspective, corn has a really important cultural significance. Corn is quintessentially Mexican, just like potatoes are Peruvian or like maple is Canadian. <laughs> it's a food that's alive with history and it has a meaning. Uh, Mexico is the birthplace of corn. And I think that's where AMLO is coming from. I think for our listeners who are outside the region or outside Mexico, I mean, everything is tied to corn in, in Mexico. Even inflation is measured in terms of the price of a kilo of tortillas. So everything goes back to corn. Yeah, there's no better way to measure inflation if you look at the price of tortillas. You're 100% right. You know, in like in Mexican mythology, the creation deity gave corn to the Aztecs. So that's how deeply imbued it's in our history and our culture. And but but, I mean, the reality is that we need open trade in order to put food on the table. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about what the economic impact could be if some of these barriers to corn imports go through? You know, there was a really interesting study by World Perspective, which is a consulting firm based in Arlington, Virginia. There's like 50,000 U.S. jobs that depend on exports, corn exports to Mexico. Mm -hmm. If if there was a sudden ban, like now we're talking about a phase out, but if there was a sudden ban, the the cost would be huge. Uh, This study from World Perspectives, a consulting firm says that 
GDP in the U.S. would fall by 30 billion in the next 10 years. Mexico's would fall by 11 billion in the same period. The cost of corn would go up by 19%, like immediately in Mexico. Mm. And if the cost of corn goes up, again, inflation would just like spiral out. Is there some way to get an idea of the sort of more phased in steps that Mexico is going for? What sort of impact we might see? Is What would a more gradual impact be? Let's say like... Mexican demand keeps prices stable in the U.S. and also in the entire corn agricultural economy from the states that I mentioned at the beginning. If there was a sudden phase out, first of all, we we would have to talk about does Mexico really have the capacity to feed itself, like be self-sufficient in corn, not just white corn and then it would be yellow corn. I don't think they have the technical capacity and that would be a plan that would have to be implemented over, I don't know, 10, 20 years. It is not a thing that could happen from one day to the other. It is just simply not realistic. One thing that I wanted to get an idea of is that these disputes are coming up under a fairly young trade agreement, which is the USMCA, TEMEC in Mexico. Can you put this dispute into a larger context of comparing USMCA to NAFTA? Are we seeing more disputes under USMCA than under NAFTA? Can you give us the larger context of this dispute compared to other disputes? I think that's a really good question. And and like one of the key improvements coming from NAFTA to USMCA is our dispute resolution mechanisms. Uh, USMCA has been plenty more successful in reaching agreements between the three countries. Back when NAFTA, it was really difficult to get to a panel because the country could basically veto one of the panel members and that would basically stop the entire process. Now we're under different rules. There's more certainty. There's a clear timeline now. And all the disputes that we've seen, there's been two that reached a panel in less than three years, one against the U.S., in the automotive sector and one against Canada in the dairy industry. There's also a new set of disputes, the labor disputes. Those have have been all in the automotive sector and all against Mexico, but those have been solved in in a matter of months. So I think it's uh, USMCI has been more successful in in, like finding solutions to those disputes. And if you put corn into that context, again, Corn is really important. There's like two main disputes in the context of Mexico. There's the energy dispute and then there's corn. Both touch on the same issue, which is, again, regulatory predictability. Mm -hmm. If Mexico is not clear in its commitment to a science-based, rule-based trade system, which is basically USMCA, there's going to be plenty of uncertainty. There's not going to be as much investment as, as we would see if Mexico show its commitment to the agreement. Mm -hmm. And that's why corn is such an important issue. Like if we don't find a solution for corn, other opportunities such as nearshoring would be more challenging to attract more investment if U.S. firms, if U.S. farmers, if Canadian farmers know that there's no regulatory predictability in Mexico. Got it. One last question for you. This has been really informative. What do you think is going to happen? What do you think the outlook is for this dispute? Are you optimistic? Or are you concerned that this could become a, a real sort of trade crisis between these countries? You know, I hate to be pessimistic, but I, I'm what I'm sure of is that the window of opportunity is fast closing. Mm-hmm. I think that you, you know, this back and forth hasn't led to anything of significance. Right now, I think Mexico needs to show that he wants to be perceived as a serious ally and a trade partner. That means they need to show the evidence whether those imports are bad for health or not. And they haven't they haven't shown that. You know, Mexico has imported yellow corn for over 30 years and there's no evidence of yellow corn having a negative impact on health. This is also very, very important because you want to get to, like not even to the election year in 2024, but let's look ahead again and let's think of 2026, the review period for USMCA. Mm-hmm. The three countries need to get to 2025, the end of 2025, with enough evidence that they are committed to the agreement. Not getting to a solution before reaching a panel or getting to a panel and then not respecting the panel's decision. It would just like be a very bad sign on any country's commitment to the agreement. And that's why this is so important. We have energy 
and we have corn. And I think those are like the very, if you could put it differently, those are like the litmus test for Mexico's commitment to USMCA and to the idea of North American integration. So corn as a linchpin, if you will. Diego, thank you so much for talking with me about this issue. It's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast and to hear all of your insights on this topic. Muchas gracias, Karin. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for listening. I'm your host, Karin Zesses. This episode was produced by John Orbach. The executive producer is Luisa Leme. The music in this podcast is performed by Tembembe Ensemble Continuo for America Society. Check the podcast notes for links to watch the full video and find out about upcoming concerts at musicoftheamericas.org. And right now, you're listening to Nostalgia Huasteca, a Son Huasteco trio from Mexico City that I captured in a recent live recording. We hope you enjoyed this episode. You can help us spread the word. Write us a review, give us five stars, or subscribe at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you. Thank you.